And all right, the session is now being recorded. This is lecture number four in the series on scholarly writing. And the purpose of doing these lectures is because I would love for all my students to feel confident that they can face their journey with competent writing skills. And this is Dr. Roxanne M. Williams. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to lectures one through three, I really encourage you to do so because each lecture builds upon. So the reason I use that word FACE is because it's an acronym for Focused, Accurate, Cohesive, and Excellent. And what I'm hoping is that students write well-structured paragraphs where they really understand the purpose for each sentence in a paragraph. What I really find doctoral students doing really often is they will write about a topic and as long as they think that all the sentences in the, on the, in the paragraph are about the same main idea, they think they're focused. Um, but I find that if they think more critically about what it is about that main idea that they want to focus that paragraph on, um, their sentences really do flow more logically. So, for example, if you were going to write a paragraph about mentoring, what about mentoring are you going to focus your attention on? A lot of students would just, you know, start that paragraph about mentoring and one sentence would talk about mentor and protege personality styles. The next sentence might talk about some empirical research um, about conferencing skills and maybe another sentence would talk about communication barriers and then they would tie it together and they felt like, well, the whole paragraph was about mentoring. Well, yes, okay, but the thing is your reader was really a little bit confused about really what the main point was. And so uh, I would suggest that you always think very carefully when you're writing your main idea sentence about what about that main idea you want to focus your attention on. So you might write a sentence that said something like, uh, mentors may experience three communication barriers during conferencing, conferencing sessions. So all of a sudden, we're not just talking about mentors. We're talking about communication barriers of mentors. And so then the rest of the sentences in that paragraph aren't just talking about mentoring, but talking about the communication barriers of mentors. And so if you really frame that main idea sentence well, and you really focus your attention about a specific area of your main idea, it really helps your paragraphs uh, be more concise. Um, also, an area that I believe is really important when you're constructing a paragraph is to make sure that your writing is accurate, especially uh, in scholarly paragraphs. You need to have evidence um, in your paragraph um, that is from scholarly sources. Accurate also means that you should be using correct grammar, of course. Uh, cohesive writing means that one sentence builds upon the next. And for those of you who have listened to the previous sessions, we talked about using power writing, where your minor uh, detail sentences naturally flow out of your main uh, support sentences. So there needs to be a building of one thought upon the next. Um, and then we've also talked about excellence, and that really has to do with really good, impactful word choice, and also about having a link sentence at the end of each paragraph that ties the paragraph together and also links to the next paragraph. So I believe that that is part of uh, what makes for excellence. Okay, so let's uh, move to our next slide. So in scholarly writing, um, the University of Phoenix has provided for us a document called the Meal Plan. And I hope you've had a chance to look at that document. <clears throat> and so today what we're going to be talking about is what the Meal Plan is. We had hit upon it a little bit in session three, but we'll uh, delve into it a little bit uh, deeper today. 
And then we're going to compare the meal plan uh, to expository writing a little bit because I think there's a, a real close connection between the two. We will also be talking about what the meal plan is not. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, correct use of APA. Uh, session five will hit upon APA um, a lot more strongly than tonight, but we will talk about it a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about the meal plan. Uh, you'll notice that the M uh, stands for main idea, and my belief is that every scholarly paragraph should have a main idea sentence, and there may be some people who dispute that, and, and that's fine. You know, people can have different opinions, but my experience has been that it's not only good for the writer, it also is good for the reader. It just really helps uh, everyone understand what the focus is of that particular paragraph. I strongly believe the main idea uh, sentence should have the main idea word or phrase. It should have a relationship word, and it also um, should have only words in it that can be mirrored in the rest of the paragraph. And we'll be talking about that in more detail in just a, mu a moment. Okay, so the next part of the meal plan are, is the evidence sentence. You'll notice it's orange, and I always color code things when I write paragraphs for purposes of instruction. Um, an evidence sentence um, is going to be in scholarly writing is going to have a citation uh, associated with it. For those of you who have been listening to my previous lectures, um, those evidence sentences are really the power to sentences, um, and they're the main supports, the main supports for your main idea. Then following the evidence sentence, we always have an analysis sentence. This is really important. It's the minor details that support what you had just said in the previous sentence. So in the previous sentence, that evidence sentence that you had some important citation with, you are now going to analyze uh, that citation and you're going to put your own interpretation into it. So I see a lot of times students don't have these analysis sentences and they're really important because if all you do is have a string of quotes, uh, then really the other people have more of a say so in that piece of writing than you do. <laughs> and, and so the analysis is what you are saying about um, your topic. And so it's real important that you have analysis sentences and we'll again be talking about that in a little bit more detail. And then in the meal plan, the last sentence, that blue one there, is our link sentence. And it's that sentence that ties the graph together and if it's written well, it links to the next paragraph. It really helps the reader understand the logic and organization of your paper. Okay, so I know it might be a little bit hard to read because I put so much on one screen, but I am going to read to you um, this paragraph, and you can tell that it's color-coded. So I'm just going to mention to you that that first sentence is red. I did purposely uh, make part of it yellow and purple, and I'll discuss that later. But that first sentence is the main idea sentence. That orangish-brown sentence is the evidence sentence. All that green area is the analysis. And then the blue sentence at the bottom is the link sentence. And again, I realize there's some purple and yellow in that link sentence at the bottom. And there's a purpose for that as well. So I'm going to read this to you. And then we're going to kind of break it down and analyze it. OK, so this is a well-structured paragraph, scholarly paragraph, using the meal plan. Exemplary followers may create effective leadership through constructive feedback. Perhaps exemplary followers will ensure the leader receives constructive, excuse me, constructive feedback on their leadership performance and also, this follower will ensure the leader receives constructive feedback on the success of the process undertaken to achieving their common goal. 
Leaders that are not intent on improving their performance and achieving goals may require employees that have insights into impactful leadership decisions. Asking specific questions of the exemplary followers, not the pure press, may aid leaders to successfully restructure programs and position personnel effectively. For example, the impact of having a principal's spouse working as a teacher aide in first year teacher's classrooms may be discussed with a veteran teacher that is noted for being an exemplary follower. The exemplary follower may heighten the principal's awareness of his or her performance in decision making, especially if those decisions may cause employees' trust of the principal's motives. The exemplary follower may magnify the principal's understanding of the value of consulting followers by avoiding future leader follower conflicts. Leadership effectiveness may be dependent on exemplary followers and the willingness of the leader to learn from constructive feedback. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to be reading every screen, okay? <laughs> uh, but I, I purposely felt like I needed to read that out loud to kind of give us all uh, context for what I want to talk about here. Okay, first of all, let's look at that first sentence. Um, okay, I said that there's a, a connection problem. Are you all hearing me okay? I hope. I hope that you are. <laughs> um, the first sentence, um, exemplary followers may create effective leadership through constructive feedback. I want you to notice that I followed the rules for the main idea sentence. The rules are that you have to have your main idea concept, word or phrase, which is exemplary followers, and then the relationship word or phrase which is constructive feedback. And then the rest of the sentence, the rest of that main idea sentence is not fluff. It is stuff that's going to be mirrored in the rest of the paragraph because the rest of the paragraph is going to be talking about um, what connection there is between uh, the followers and the leaders and how that connection is made through the constructive feedback. Okay, then you'll see that brown sentence, okay? So that brown sentence is our evidence sentence. And so you can tell that I cited Thomas there. I used um, the year of publication. And since um, the, this particular article, the way it was written, didn't have page numbers, I did put the paragraph uh, where I found that. And it gave some really good evidence for what I was saying. That there's a connection between followers and leaders if feedback is given well. And so I gave evidence. It wasn't just me saying this. I found some really good scholarly evidence to support that. And then you'll notice all my green sentences. Oh my goodness. You'll most notice I do not have just one green sentence. You'll notice that there's actually quite a few there. You'll also notice that each green sentence um, one builds upon the next. Uh, my first green sentence very much links to my orange-brown sentence. Um, this um, really kind of reiterated uh, the whole concept of performance and achieving goals. But then from there, I just dig into it deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I just basically kind of introduced the concept that this feedback is important. But then I start giving a, even a specific example of all of this. You know, we're talking about the, the uh, uh, the principal's wife being in the classroom and, and how maybe that wasn't a really great administrative decision and how this veteran teacher talks to the principal about that so that in the future uh, this leader uh, will hopefully uh, think a little bit more about some of the decisions that he makes and how that impacts the rest of the followers and, and how that makes them feel comfortable or uncomfortable in their uh, job situation. So I kind of break, broke that down and, and gave more and more specific detail to this constructive feedback. And then, of course, I ended it with a link sentence in which, look at that blue sentence, please. You'll notice that I repeated exemplary followers because that's my main idea. I also repeated um, 
the relationship word there. What about exemplary followers were we focusing our attention upon? It was the constructive feedback of the exemplary followers. And so I did repeat that. And you'll also notice that um, I used the term willingness of the leader in my link sentence. And so this is my thought, folks, is that my next paragraph, in which I'm still going to be talking about followers and leaders, but I'm going to be talking now a little bit more about willingness of the leaders to receive feedback from the followers. And so you can tell that I've kind of given the reader a little foreshadowing that, hey, this is what I'm going to be talking about in the next paragraph. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So just to kind of reiterate what the meal plan is, it's a main idea sentence followed by evidence. And the evidence in scholarly writing is always going to be with a citation, followed by analysis of that evidence, and then followed by a link sentence. Um, so I think the meal plan really helps students identify um, the purposes for each of the sentences um, in a paragraph. It helps students write a logically flowing paragraph. Um, but I want you to realize, too, that it's not a super rigid formula. So we're going to be talking about what it is and now a little bit more about what it is not. So what is the meal plan not? Here's one of the myths. When I first started teaching the meal plan to doctoral students, a lot of them thought that every paragraph should be four sentences long. So one main idea sentence followed by one evidence sentence, followed by one analysis sentence, followed by a link sentence. It's true that you could do that. You could have a four-sentence paragraph, and sometimes that would be very appropriate. There's nothing wrong with conciseness. But, of course, um, it's not always going to be exactly that way. I do suggest you always only have one main idea sentence. <laughs> if you have more than one main idea sentence, I think you need to create a second paragraph. <laughs> um, and of course, you'll always only have one uh, link sentence. However, uh, let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, remember my example a few minutes ago where I talked about a mentors may experience three communication barriers during conferencing sessions? Well, in that instance, um, you might end up having your main idea sentence first, and then your first evidence sentence talking about a specific communication barrier. And then you might have an analysis sentence, of course, underneath that. And then you'd have your second evidence sentence for your second identification of a communication barrier, followed by another analysis sentence. And then another evidence sentence of your third communication barrier type that you name, followed by another analysis sentence, and then a link. So in this instance, you would have an M-E-A, E-A, E-A, L paragraph. And so that is a logical flow, uh, but always, 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 there's one main idea sentence, there's one link sentence at the end, and of course, after every piece of evidence you have, you should have analysis underneath it. If you don't have analysis underneath it, again, remember, these other authors have a bigger voice in your piece of writing than you do. <laughs> and you don't want that to be true when you're a scholar. Okay, something else that um, the meal plan is not. I love this picture. I hope that you find it really humorous. Um, obviously, this child is not happy with the meal plan. <laughs> I hope you're laughing out there like I am. Um, not every paragraph in a lengthy essay or in a dissertation is going to follow the meal plan. I had a student ask me this the other day. For example, when you start writing your dissertation, there's going to be a section of your um, dissertation where you're supposed to write definitions of terminology that's in your dissertation. And so it's basically just, you know, a listing. You have uh, a word, and then you have a definition with a citation. And then you have another uh, term that's significant to your dissertation um, that 
you identify, you give the definition, and then you give a citation for. And so obviously there's going to be some sections of your dissertation where you're not going to use the meal plan. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you're beginning a, a big section of your dissertation on theory. And so before you actually begin all these paragraphs where you're discussing different theorists, uh, let's say, uh, on emotional intelligence or whatever, um, your introduction paragraph would probably not follow the meal plan. Your introduction paragraph might be something like this. You'd have your idea sentence where you say something like, um, three theorists have been cited in this uh, paper to support the concept of mentor theory, whatever. I don't know, that's not a very good example, but whatever. You just basically are telling the main idea sense, basically telling everybody, hey, I'm going to be talking about three theorists. And then in your second sentence, you would list those three theories and make it into a complete sentence, of course. And then you'd have, of course, a citation with it. And then your third sentence would just be a link sentence where, okay, the following discussion, blah, blah, blah. So it would be just a three-sentence paragraph that introduces this larger section on mentor theory. And then, of course, then you'd have multiple paragraphs. And I would suggest, of course, that each of those paragraphs where you're discuss discussing uh, different mentor theories, um, that all of those paragraphs do follow the meal plan, okay? Um, but I'm just saying that there's some paragraphs, like an introduction paragraph, or maybe even a conclusion paragraph. Let's say you've written this whole big section about mentor theorists. Then at the very end, again, you might have like a three-sentence paragraph that like ties together this big section where you just kind of reiterate, okay, everybody, I've just talked about these three mentor theorists. Um, um, blah 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 and it would be real concise and it's not you're not trying to analyze anything at this point you're just basically kind of trying to tie together that section of the paper okay let's go on to the next myth um, a myth is that the main idea is optional and um, even though some people in different genres of writing would say that a main idea sentence isn't necessary, and maybe that is probably true in certain genres, but in scholarly writing, uh, a main idea, sentence, main idea sentence is not something that you can leave out of a paragraph. And quoted Zig Ziglar there, um, I didn't have uh, a a document to refer to is just from my memory <laughs> so sorry for that that I don't have a year associated with some publication but I love this quote from him the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing <laughs> and so I think a lot of times people lose perspective and they're not really quite sure what they're trying to say and definitely then of course the readers aren't sure what the writer is trying to say because they didn't really tell us what the main thing was. <laughs> so, main idea sentence, it's not optional. It does need to be part of each um, scholarly paragraph. Another myth, I love this picture. Um, it's supposed to look like the missing link. <laughs> and uh, I, I often, often, often have seen uh, students uh, pieces of writing that they haven't had a uh, link sentence at the end of their paragraph. So they definitely have a missing link <laughs> in their paragraph. And so maybe this humorous picture will help you remember that um, at the end of each paragraph, you do need to have an ending sentence that ties the paragraph together and links it to the following paragraph. So the link sentence is not optional. You have to have it. <laughs> Okay, let's go to our next myth. Um, the next myth is that the evidence sentence comes directly after the main idea sentence. I would say most of the time it does in the meal plan. However, I want everyone, of course, to be logical, to think about your writing. Let's just say you've written your main idea sentence and 
you use some term that you really think that your audience might not be familiar with. So before you go on to supporting your main idea with that wonderful cited evidence sentence that comes next, you just think, you know, I think I need to explain one of the terms uh, a little bit more clearly in my um, paragraph. So after the main idea sentence, you might digress and uh, provide uh, a definition for one of those terms. Or maybe there's just something you think is a little bit unclear about your main idea sentence and you feel like you need it to sneak in an extra sentence after the main idea sentence to kind of digress and explain a little bit of the context of what you're talking about, possibly. And then once you establish that, then yes, yay, go on with the rest of the paragraph with your evidence sentence and your analysis sentences and then your length sentence. The, the main point is, is that it should be logical. It should make sense. And if something isn't making sense to you as you're writing, it's probably not going to make sense to your, write, uh, to your reader either. So, so please um, realize that the meal plan is not, you know, so rigid that you never can uh, digress from it, but it is a, a basic structure that should help you to be successful. But of course, you have to use um, common sense. All right, so this is our last um, myth. And the myth is, is that only the evidence sentence should have a citation. And I had kind of a nice um, picture I showed you there. I thought it was a little bit humorous. Um, you can see that somebody took a photo and then they were showing how they were using APA to um, give credit to whoever had taken that photo. Any sentence in scholarly writing that isn't common knowledge and is not your own orig original idea has to have a citation. And so I realize that some of you are real new to using APA, and so it's going to take you a while to get used to this. But oh my goodness, you're going to find that you're going to be using a lot of citations. Uh, so you might have a citation, um, you know, a little parentheses after your main idea sentence, because maybe you say something like, um, Emotional intelligence theory um, uh, is based upon social intelligence theory. Well, you weren't the person who invented emotional intelligence or created the theory on social intelligence. Somebody else did. You didn't. So since it's not your own idea, you have to put a citation after it. You might have... Um, citation um, at the end of your link sentence. So here you wrote your link sentence, you're tying your paragraph together, but there you go, you put little parentheses after it because, again, maybe you, maybe you even, let, let's say, the paragraphs about theorists, and maybe you list the three theorists that you had talked about um, in that paragraph. You list them in your link sentence. If you do that, you have to give those theorists credit. So even though the purpose of that link sentence is to tie the paragraph together, the purpose of the link sentence isn't really to provide evidence to your main idea. But nevertheless, if you're you know, talking about something that is not your original idea, you have to give credit to those authors. Um, in your analysis sentence, you may or may not use citations. But again, if you're comparing and contrasting um, different theorists and, and what points that they made and how uh, their um, theories differ, and those are your ideas when you're talking about what you're noting about what was similar and what was different about their theories. But again, if you name, one of those theorists in your analysis sentence, by golly, you have to give them credit. <laughs> so again, here comes the parentheses again, even in the middle of an analysis sentence, even though it's your idea, your idea about how you're comparing and contrasting all these theorists, 
then it's truly your analysis, but you do have to put that um, citation in there to show uh, that, um, you know, th that, that original, original idea um, that you're discussing did come from somebody else. So you're going to find there's going to be a lot of parentheses, <laughs> a lot of citations uh, within your writing. Please understand that there's a different purpose for each sentence in your paragraph, but you might end up actually having a citation in all the types of sentences, but depending upon what you're saying in that paragraph. Okay, so this is the end of lecture number four. Um, I hope that you're starting to learn a little bit more about the expectations for scholarly writing and that you're having a sense of that you can face your journey with competent writing skills. I do have references um, at the end of this presentation in case someone would like to refer to those, including uh, my email address if you'd like to contact me with some questions that you have.